30 years of uh, knowing the Lord, I've gotten used to the fact that when I start to run into issues and problems, it usually often means that there's a good chance I'm doing the right thing. Um, so with that, I won't tell you what, how my day and my week has been, but we had some technical difficulties just now. Thank you for hanging out and uh, waiting for us. We appreciate it. So we're going to start the class today. Um, we're going to be covering uh, this class number three, really the seven days of creation. Okay, so heaven and earth, man and woman uh, being uh, created in all that uh, way that God did that. So looking forward to it. And again, thank you for your patience. So let's start off with some questions. Yep, that's one of those days. Not going to work. Let's try it again. Okay. Hey, guys in the sound room, I can't get the uh, slides to go forward. The light's green on the side, and I'm pressing the right button. It's got a big yellow sticker on it, so I won't forget. So I think Ted's making sure it's cycled correctly. Doing a lot of cycling today. Should have brought my bike. There we go. Questions. All right. Again, thank you for, for your patience. Appreciate it. Questions. Okay, here we go. The Bible states, this is a review of last lesson, the Bible states that God is worthy of no praise, some praise, all praise. Everyone together? All praise. All, praise. all right. Preparing to go. I'd love to hear it. According to the Bible, what does God need to exist? The basic essentials of all life, eternal matter, nothing. Let's see, nothing. That's right. Very good. I think I got that one backwards. Yep, looks like I did. The Bible says that God is blank, existing from, from everlasting past to everlasting future. God is eternal. Very good. That's right. The Bible says that God created himself in eternity past. True or false? False. It's false. God has always just existed. Mind-blowing. God has many names which describe his character. One of these is the name indicative that he is the self-existent one. He is the I am. I am. He just always has been the self-existent one. He needs nothing to exist. The name Lord focuses our attention on God's position. He is Lord of Lords. True or false? A little more hesitant that time. True or false? True. True. Very good. Okay. The Bible emphasizes that there is only one God. Very good. Very good. Angelic beings were created to serve God. True or false? True. That's right. Very good. Very good. As the most high, God is, pick two, seated high in the sky, Supreme ruler, king of the universe. B and C, B and C, right? He's the supreme ruler and king of the universe. The Bible indicates that angels are, take these two, take two out of these three, innumerable, invisible, equal to God. A and B, that's right. They are not equal to God. That's correct. Okay, circle the words that most correctly communicate God's relationship with his created beings. Someone give me a raise. Of, give me, someone raise their hand. Yep, still got the word circle in there. Still didn't fix that. Thanks for pointing that out, Sam. Appreciate that. Ben. He who creates the paddle also owns the paddle. Very good. That's right. He who creates the paddle also owns the paddle. Almost loud enough for the people on Zoom to hear. I appreciate that. That's good. If they turned up the volume, they probably could have heard you. The Bible says God is invisible because he is a, oh, a little more hesitant on that one. We got gotcha. you. Because he is a spirit. spirit. Counting letters comes out to five, six. There we go. When God created Lucifer, he made him perfect in every way. He was given special responsibilities. He was no different than other angels. A and B, that's right. The word worship means to declare a person's worth. 
worth. That's right. Very good. Okay, good. Good review. Good quick review. Like I said, we have a lot to cover, and I think there's something really behind what's going on with the technical difficulties and all the issues. I know in my week, and maybe in your week as well, to get here tonight, but I appreciate you guys being here. The first book in the Bible is called Genesis. So we're going to head back to Genesis. So if you have a Bible in front of you, just go ahead and open them back up. We started with the first uh, four words uh, in Genesis. And a lot of the first two lessons have been kind of introductory and kind of warming us up to the Bible. And now we're really going to start moving. There's a lot of scriptures to cover today. And there will be a lot as we start moving through the scriptures. Um, there's a lot to cover. And uh, it'll take us, we'll be, I'll try not to go too fast. Um, but again, we're starting in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. And uh, we're going to start, uh, and it's just the fact that Genesis means beginnings, uh, beginnings. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God said, God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So it says, in the beginning, God created. Now, to create something shows profound power. But to create anything, or more importantly, everything, out of nothing, now that's just beyond our imagination. When we create things, uh, my, my daughter, when my daughter likes to paint, she has a paint, little painting she'll give me, and she does, I think, a pretty good job. She needs materials to work with, right? A canvas, and then oils and, and pigment make up paint. Uh, the building we're in right now, someone had to build this. They had to build it out of uh, paint and wood. There's wiring. You need materials to build with. But when God created, he used nothing. That shows that he's what? He's all powerful. He needed no materials, no blueprints, no workshop, no tools. And, and that kind of ability is just like totally foreign to us. The Bible tells us that creation was possible simply because God is able. His power has no limit. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. He's truly all-powerful. Besides being all-powerful, he also has unlimited knowledge. He's all-knowing. Great is our Lord. His understanding has no limit. The scriptures are really, really clear, clear on this. He doesn't need to check with an architect or an engineer or look at the blueprints for more information or to get somebody's help. He's not confined to those types of parameters. And besides having all knowledge and all power, the Bible clearly states that God is everywhere present at one time. We, when we're going to create something, we need a, a workplace um, a shop or a studio. And God is not limited by that. He's everywhere present at one time. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? Only God possesses this triad of attributes of having all power and all knowledge and being present everywhere at one time. And really, it's just the perfect combination of those three attributes can make the world as perfectly as God made it when he created it. He has made the earth by his power. He has established it. He has established the world by his wisdom, and stretched out the heaven by his understanding. The angels don't possess any of these qualities, as, as powerful and as intelligent as they are. 
and you and me, we don't come anywhere close at all. For us to even con construct, say, this simple little guitar stand right here. It's not too complicated, right? It's actually fairly, fairly simple when you think about it, but what's it made out of? Well, predominantly, I believe it's made out of metal here. It's painted metal. So let's just talk about the metal. Where do you get metal from? Well, it comes from rocks, right? But which rocks do, has iron ore in them? Do you know? Well, then you have to go ask a geologist, right? He knows which rocks to get iron ore out of. But how are you going to get iron ore, those rocks, out of the ground? Well, you got to have someone who knows something about dynamite and hopefully safely about dynamite, right, to get the rocks out of the ground. But now that you've got the rocks out of the ground, you have a pile of rubble. Then what do you do? Well, someone's got to know something about the, the, what's called the smelting process of taking those rocks and extracting the iron out of the rocks and making it to something that you can start to work with. Well, how hot does that need to be? I don't know. Do you? I don't know about smelting and, and alloys. So even if you could do that and you can melt the rocks down to, to iron ore, now you've got to shape it because you don't want to sit on a lump of metal, right? You wouldn't want to, if it's a chair, you, wanna put, you can't put your guitar up against a lump of metal and the stand. Someone's got to shape it and form it as you see these tubes are being formed. How do you shape liquid metal? How hot does it need to be? It can't be liquid. It's got to be somewhat solid, right? What's the right temperature? I don't know. Then what about after that? Well, there's multiple pieces in this stand. So you have to have someone who can weld it, and then you have some plastic pieces on here, like this little knob right here. Where does plastic come from? It comes from oil, doesn't it? It's a petroleum product, isn't it? Well, where do you find oil, and how are you going to get it out of the ground, right? I'm asking you a bunch of questions. I don't know, Charlie. Well, I don't know either, you see? But that's who we are. We, we have limited knowledge, right? And it takes a combined hundreds of people and working together in our allied skills to make a guitar stand, you see? That's not who God is. God already has all knowledge, all power, and he can put it wherever he wants because he's everywhere present at one time. None of us, human or angelic, can come even close to these type of attributes. God stands alone. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth. By your great power and outstretched arm, there is nothing too hard for you. The act of this monumental creative work that God is doing, uh, it's recorded really just simply and concisely in a few chapters in the book of Genesis. Uh, the staggering information that we see there is stated in just a few words. For example, the biblical text makes only a passing reference to the means at which God created everything. He didn't use his hands. God just spoke everything into existence. God said, let there be light. The entire universe was formed at God's command. I mean, just that ability to think that God just speaks and it comes into existence. It just, it, would, it blows your mind away. I can't speak another guitar stand into existence. I'm happy as a father, but I can just say something to my kids and it might get done. Right? To speak and things come from nothing into existence is incredible power. You <sighs> Amazing. But then when you think about it, you would expect an almighty God would be exactly that. That he could do this, that that kind of power. It says in the scriptures, 
By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the, wor- of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. Commanded, and it stood fast. God speaks, and it happens. So that's the way it started. God spoke, and he said, let there be light. And on the first day, he separated the light from the darkness. And it was evening, and it was morning, and that was the first day. That was the first day of creation. Now let's talk about some of these, some of these concepts real, real quick, about God being everywhere, one at the same time. Because some things are more comprehensible, like saying God has all power or all knowledge. Sometimes that's easier for us to, to take in. But when you think about it, it's actually comforting to know that God can be everywhere at one time. I've been to Asia a few times, and I had to leave most of my family behind. And so when I went to Asia, I'd like to know that God is going to be with me when I go to Asia, but he's also with my family back here in California. So if something happens to them or to me, we know that he's both. He's with us both, whether here or there. But it's also can be very frightening to know that God is everywhere at one time. If you do something wrong, where are you going to hide? You can't hide from God. He's everywhere. 10th century BC, a king of Israel wrote these words you see here. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely darkness, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. The fact that God is everywhere at the same time needs to be differentiated between, uh, from that and a concept called pantheism. Pantheism teaches That God is in everything, and everything is God. Okay? That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the Lord is distinct from his creation. He is not part of it. The scripture defines God as being, as a being as well. He is a distinct being, not some type of transcendental force. Do you not know, have you not heard... The Lord is an eternal God, the creator of the whole earth. He does not get tired or weary. There is no limit to his wisdom. Also, another thing to think about, we're talking about the Bible. It's an old book, but it's been extremely accurate. Centuries ago, there there was this thought that the world was flat, but that actually never came from the Bible. The scripture uses a word that alludes to the spherical shape of the world when it says when it says he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and then other ancients you know speculated that the earth was on some solid foundation held up by some mythological god the bible has never stated that the bible states this he hangs the earth on nothing Now, how could they have known that thousands of years ago? Because God's the author of the Bible. He understood how the earth rotated in space around the sun. Seems like it hangs on nothing. That's how accurate the Bible has been for a long time. Uh, An ancient Greek, Ptolemy, in the second century, cataloged about over a thousand stars until Galileo came out with a telescope. And with Galileo's telescope, he can catalog 5,000 stars, which seems like a lot. But you remember what we looked at last week with all those galaxies and all those super clusters, billions and billions times billions of stars. It's more than 5,000. That's what the ancient thought was, but the Bible actually has always said that the number of stars is similar to the sand by the seashore. And if you think of what we looked at last week and all those little dark part of the sky holding 10,000 galaxies makes a lot more sense 
There's a lot more stars than Ptolemy or Galileo could see, or even what we can see, but now we can see more. So the Bible has been, it's an old book, but it's been very accurate. Back to creation. God has started his work. He's, he's started day one. He separated the light from the darkness. And now we're going to go, go, go into Acts 2 through 5, where we see God creating the rest of the world. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He stretched out the heavens like a canopy and spread them out like a tent to live in. So when you see this, you see this passage, you see that God's creating the world for a very specific purpose. He's creating it to be lived in, to be inhabited. To me, it reminds me of um, a couple when they're having their first baby. You know, there's that one certain room in the house that's very special, right? It's got different paint on the walls. It's got different furniture. It's, it's, it's got things in it that that baby will never even not realize for a long time. It's got a special dresser. It's got a dresser probably full of diapers and, and baby powder, and wipes. It's a special place to be inhabited. God was creating a special place to be inhabited. The Bible likens it to like a, a tent, where it's like it says in the last part of that verse, which to dwell in, a unique homestead in all the universe. So now in day two, remember after day one, God had separated the light from the darkness, but we still have water covering the face of the earth. So God says on day two, let there, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate water from water. God, God called the expanse sky, and there was evening and there was morning a second day. So I want to paint this picture for you. So there was the earth and was filled with water. Okay? And since God wanted to be inhabited, he needed to change things of how the earth looked then. So he took the water, and it seems like he separated the water that's on the earth, and he made a canopy of water around the earth. And the space in between the water that was still on the earth and this canopy of water he put around the earth, he calls it expanse, we call it atmosphere, or we call it sky. So it's this, it's this concept of the way God first created the world is quite different than the way we know it now. And we're going to look at what changed that environment as we progress through the Bible. But that's exactly what it says there is, here is the water below. He made water above. And these aren't just the clouds, because it says water, not just clouds. And it's covering, surrounding the earth. The beginning of day three, the water under the expanse still constituted one vast ocean over the whole world. There was no dry land. Sorry, I'm, I'm missing some of the best pictures. The best I could try to figure out, but that's just a really nice looking cloud. That's not a, a canopy of water. So on day three, it says this, God said that the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. It was so. God called the dry ground land and the, and, and the gathered waters he called seas. God saw that it was good. God said, let the land produce vegetation, plants yielding seeds according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. It was so. So you can see that day three can be divided into two parts. First, we have dry land appearing. So God took the, the ocean basins and he lowered them. As he lowered them, the water would sink down and the land would appear. If you can see a topographical map of here's the water line, any, even the smallest island looks like a huge mountaintop from underneath the water. And that's what you have. You have God lowering the, the ocean basins and then land appearing. And then you see the creation of plants and trees as well. The land produced vegetation, plants yielding seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning a third day. So that's kind of an illustration, the best I could do to try to picture that concept of, that, of the water just receding and the land beginning to fill 
uh, or to present itself to the, to the surface. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. So for the very beginning, God was preparing this world to be inhabited. And now he's brought plants along, which are very important. Plants are good for food. They're good for oxygen and for future construction materials. On the fourth day of creation, um, God had, excuse me, on the first day of creation, God had drawn back the curtain and pulled light away from darkness. Now we're going to see on the fourth day of creation, God's going to create the light givers. God said, let there be light. Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be signs to indicate seasons and days and years. And let them serve as lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. It was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule over the day and the lesser light to rule over the night. He made the stars also. God placed the lights in the expanse of the sky to shine on the earth, to preside over the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. It seems strange to us that God could create light on day one and the light givers on day four, but for God, it's just as easy for him to create either one. I am the Lord who made everything, who alone stretched out the sky. He made the moon to mark the months, and the sun sets according to a regular schedule. So you think about it, the sun, the moon, the stars, they all move with incredible accuracy. Who here has heard of tidal charts? Tide charts. And what is a tide chart? It tells you a year in advance what is the height of that tide going to be in that place in the world. Now, how could that possibly be? Because God is a God of order. And the way he set up his creation, he set it up with great precision and order. We launched satellites, and I haven't kept track of the, the more recent ones, I think to Mars, but there was a satellite that went to Jupiter. I think it was the Galileo satellite. It took it six years to get there. You know when it got there? Right on schedule. Because these, these laws and these things that God's placed, these physical laws, they stay consistent. They don't change. Sunrise and sunset. You can ask Siri or Google, what time is the sunset going to be today? And, it's, and they'll know exactly when it's going to be. So this is a set pattern. If there wasn't a set pattern to this world, nothing would survive. The order observed in the universe is the, the result of physical laws that govern all things. We study those laws in, in different types of uh, subjects like uh, astronomy and physics and chemistry and, and biology. God established these physical laws to hold the universe together with incredible precision. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You know, we take these laws so much for granted that we never consider what it would be like without them. So just imagine... That for a few seconds, maybe a minute or so, every couple of two or three days, gravity just stopped working. What would life be like? Imagine, all of us just start floating up in the air. Sounds kind of fun at first, until you realize this building is floating up and you're still in it. Right? The oceans are now floating up in the sky and they eventually have to come back down again. Right? It would be chaos. We've got a little amusing little picture here. This guy says, what's the headline say there? News, gravity doesn't exist. 
It's interesting, even the manhole's pulling up, but somehow this guy's shoes must be nailed to the ground. I'm not sure why he's not floating up in the sky. Seems humorous at first, but it would be absolutely terrifying. It'd be deadly. Laws define uncompromising boundaries as to how something will function. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You've established the heavenly lights and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. Almost instinctively, we treat these laws that are in place around us with a lot of respect. For example, I've hiked up to the back of Half Dome in Yosemite. And, uh, and when you're on top of Half Dome, you can actually take a picture that looks a lot like that. That's just part of the, the top of Half Dome as it sticks out, and you can take a picture from one side to one of the other tips. Uh, that's not me, but I've got similar pictures. I think they affectionately call that the diving board. But it's, to me, what's even more interesting um, is one of the signs on the way up there. You see, whenever you have a law, you also have a, con- a consequence for breaking that law. If you don't respect where you're standing right there, and you decide to get a little too close to the edge, you're going to learn the consequence of not respecting gravity. Here's another consequence. This is a startling picture to me. This is a sign near one of the falls. Uh, I think I showed this to my daughter when we we hiked up there before. Um, Sometimes you'll see warning signs. They'll say things like, do not do this because you might risk... uh, Uh, injury or possible death. Well, that's not what this sign says. This sign is near a waterfall on the hike up to Half Dome. I believe it's by Nevada Waterfall. And it says very clearly in the second paragraph, stay back from slippery rock at the water's edge. If you go over the fall, you will die. Okay, so very clear here. The physical abilities of that water and those rocks below don't leave any options. Those physical laws are stated, and we realize the state is what? Death. Period. So whenever you have a law, you also have a consequence for breaking that law. Unless you're a a daredevil, you tend to stay away from flirting with those consequences. You stay away like the plague, like they're the plague. These laws, the structure and order, are a reflection of God's nature. They are who he is. It's the way he is. On the fifth day, God created a whole kaleidoscope of birds and sea life. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. So God created sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And, and if you just see there, I mean, actually, this actually reminded me of a trip to Alaska I once took on a cruise. Whales were bouncing out of the ocean, and there was bald eagles just everywhere. Just beautiful. Just beautiful, God's creation. But when we get to day six, we see the pinnacle of God's creative act. God began day six by creating the land animals, And God saw that it was good, so the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said on the sixth day, Let the earth bring forth a living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Did you catch some of the repetition in there? It's a phrase that tends to be repeated. Did you see that on days three, five, and six? Particularly related to plants and sea life and birds and animals. Each one was made according to their kind. So what does that mean, according to their kind? Well, it simply means this, that cats give birth to what? Cats. Cats. We're going to get to cats in a second. I like this picture because I think it was some little kids drawing and then they stuck their little dinosaurs out in front because God made those too. (laughs) 
dogs give birth to what? Puppies. Cats give birth to kittens, right? I did that too. I said dogs give birth to dogs when I was practicing. I'm like, oh, wait, they give birth to puppies. Cats give birth to kittens, right? You don't have to worry if you're going to plant a tulip bulb that a cedar tree is going to come out. That's not going to happen. Now, within these different kinds, you can have different varieties for sure. You can take two different types of dogs and make all sorts of different combinations and breeds out of them. You can get everything from poodles to Great Danes. But the bottom line is they're still dogs. Nothing new has been added to them. On the other hand, on the other hand because kinds are fixed, you don't have to worry about a, a farmer's cow you know, crossing the fence and breeding with that prize horse. You're not going to see something like this. Right? We look at that and we laugh. I think it's kind of gross. That's completely doctored, by the way. That's a made-up picture. But once again, we see that God embedded in the system physical laws to maintain order. Okay? I'll say it again. Once again, we see that God embedded in the system physical laws to maintain order. As the universe was recreated, the Bible says repeatedly that God saw that it was good. It's none of those, those small little statements that's just packed full of meaning. When God created, he made things truly good. As for God, his way is perfect. The, world, the word of the Lord is flawless. We, we can make things, and we, when we make them, we can never make anything flawless. We, we can make something that's pretty acceptable, but usually we can tell what's wrong with it, especially if we're the ones who've made it. Ask the, uh, the designer what's wrong with the design or the painter what's wrong with the, 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 the painting, and they can tell you. But that's not God. When God creates something, he makes it without fault, without flaw. The Bible says that God himself is perfect without blemish, we use words like holy and righteous to describe this aspect of who God is, his perfection. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Splendid and majestic is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. The holy God will show himself holy in righteousness. We'll take a deeper look at these words as we progress through the Bible. But for now, all we need to know is that the words holy and righteous are used to describe this aspect of God's perfect nature. And you can't overemphasize this. Uh, you, you, you can't speak about this too much. It's a part that must not be missed. It's that part of the puzzle that is, is key to understanding how the Bible fits together. So keep this in mind as, as we continue to study. Perfection is fundamental to God's character. Because he is perfect, he could only make a perfect creation. Creation has changed, as, as we're going to see, but in the beginning, it was just right. It was good. It was perfect. Now, God could have created all the plants and animals in black and white. But instead, he created everything with just incredible variety. I go on walks, two-hour walks, and this, is, this, is on, this isn't on one of my walks. But I'll see that the front of people's houses are just incredible. The variety of colors and things that you can see and appreciate and, and experience. Not only did God invent color and all the different pigments and hues and the variety, he also created our eyes to pick up as much as we can, as much as we can take in. God ensured a variety of foods that would taste good. I, I don't know how I don't have pictures of my wife's lasagna and garlic bread up here. It certainly deserves to be there. I mean, what would we do without garlic? 
right? Amen. God could have made everything taste like liver and Brussels sprouts. And I know some of you probably like liver and Brussels sprouts. I know that I don't. Maybe it would have been better with garlic. There's a good point. Everything is better with garlic. This is true. But God gives us endless flavors. He doesn't make everything the same. Then he gives us taste buds to enjoy those endless flavors, all the varieties of cooking styles. Along with many other things, he gives fragrance to flowers. The other day, my wife said, check this one out. It was a rose, and there's been so many roses that it seemed like they've been crossbred to be just pretty, but none of them smell good. And she said, smell this one, and I smelled it, and I thought, someone sprayed that with rose smell. That's sad that I had to say it that way, but it was just so fragrant. It was incredible. And then God gives us a nose to enjoy these things. He could have made everything to smell like rotten eggs. That's not the way he designed it. God could have limited plant life to a few acceptable things that would have taken care of our needs adequately. That's not who God is. He provided an overwhelming variety. Why? Because it's evident it's evidence that God cares. He cares. The Bible says that he richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. That's who God is. Not only did God have the ability and power to create everything out of nothing, but this was also combined with a loving concern. He is a God who has revealed himself with acts of kindness in the world about us. And God is still impressing us. We're getting technology so we can see out in the space. We're, we're getting down to smaller and smaller and atomic uh, atom smashers and subatomic particles and seeing things that are incredible. We're getting to the depths of the ocean with diving machines and, and seeing things we never would have seen. And we're not bored. We're fascinated. I mean, how many times have you just burned like hours and hours watching some of these things on on videos or, or on National Geographic or whatever, right? God's provided all these things for our enjoyment. It's been there all along. God is still impressing because he is awe-inspiring. That's why the Bible says, Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. But there's one more step before we put the sunset on day six, for, before God's universe is complete. That step is the creation of man and woman. For this is what the Lord says, he who created the heavens, he, he is God, he who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. The sixth day member began with the creation of animals, but now the whole story changes, and it focuses on what, on who is going to be inhabiting the earth. And you just imagine the angels. They're watching creation. They're watching God do this, and they're interested in what's going on. They're looking into this to see what's going to happen. What does God do? Who does he make? Who is all of this for? It says this in chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock, livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. It says here that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And that idea of he saying us and our, we, we will cover that later. We won't cover that today, but we'll cover it in one of the future, future classes. But do you see how men and women are created? They're created in the image of God. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean we're exact duplicates. We already kind of covered that. There's attributes of God that we didn't even come close to. But man is created in the image of God in that it's like a mirror. We reflect the object. A mirror reflects the object, but isn't the object itself. And that's kind of how we reflect God, how we're made in the image of God. There's many things we hold in common with God. First of all, God created us with a mind. We have the ability 
to investigate, to understand, to create, uh, and to reason. These are things that God possesses and he has given to us. And although we have an intellect, we're not all knowing. And, and really, our learning is, our, our knowledge is based on learning. We come into this world with nothing and we start to learn. That's how we gain our knowledge. It must be learned. God also created, besides a mind, with emotions. Now, for many people, emotions has got a bad connotation to it. But there's a good side to emotions as well. If you didn't have emotions, you'd be a robot, cold, uh, without feeling, calculated. And in contrast to that emotionless robot, the scripture tells us that the Lord is compassionate, that he's tender, that he feels angry at injustice and wrong. A heartless, unaffected God without the capacity to feel love and compassion it would be truly frightening. God created us with feelings he created us with feelings because he has feelings. The ability to choose also is what something God gave us. He gave us a will. It's the ability to make decisions. And really, it gives endless variety to life. I could already, already hear before about someone like, actually liking Brussels sprouts, and I can't believe that decision. But some people like rice. Some people like potatoes. You can have apple juice or grape juice or orange juice for breakfast. You get to choose, and it brings variety to life. And also that ability to choose, again, it separates us from the life of a robot. A robot can only do what it's pre-programmed to do. Man was given a will so he could freely follow God. He could choose to follow God. Not as a robot, but as one who has intelligently assessed the fact that God is good and has his own best interests at heart, and therefore chooses to follow God. Having an intellect, emotions, and will are all aspects of being created in God's image. There are other areas that were created in God's image. So let's, let's move on. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth, of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. The words breath of, of life are often associated with the spirit or non-material side of man. This is an, a, an additional reflection of God. Because remember, God is spirit. As we stated before, spirits cannot be seen normally. They, they don't have bodies uh, um, like flesh and bone. However, in man's case, God decided to give man's spirit... A house. That's what a body is. It's basically a, a house for his spirit to dwell in. And he formed it out of the dust of the ground. So there you have God creating uh, a body, and it's fully formed. It's completely there. But what is it? It's lifeless. There's no, there's no life in it. It was when God breathed the spirit into man that man became a living being. Only God can impart life. No angel, no man can do that. Once again, we see the Lord is completely distinct from all his created beings. He is greater than them all. The first and only man that God created was Adam. Adam just simply means man. God then created woman. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place in flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So these few verses have generated a lot of heated arguments. Some have understood that God made woman as like a second-class citizen, but it's just not the case. He took Eve, he took the woman, not for man's foot to be his slave, but from man's side to be his companion. 
Adam gave his wife a name, called her Eve, which means life giver. So God took Adam and Eve and he placed them in a special garden that he had made for them. And the garden was called Eden. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. All the gardens and the zoos of the world would not be able to be compared to this paradise. I mean, the whole world is already perfect. And within that world, God makes a special garden. I mean, to me, it's like the nursery, and then here's just the crib, or the bassinet, as it were, just to put them in. A very, very special place. I mean, you just imagine the clear water in the rivers, the, the, the beautiful trees, the animals walking around, uh, the, the, the colors. It's just hard to, hard to imagine what it looked like. Beautiful beyond description. Even the weather was different too. The Bible says the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. God even put it in a drip system. It's just perfect. It's just awesome. Really, we have very little specifics on what Eden looked like. But God made it for them special. And he wasn't going to put them in some place where they would struggle and have hardship. The garden had abundance And everything they could possibly need was adequately provided by God. It was a perfect world in which to live. But did you notice something that God didn't do? He didn't ask Adam and Eve, would you like to go into the garden? God put them in the garden. Now, how could God do that? Well, he knew what was best for them. God could act without consulting them. Why? Because he was their creator. And if he is their creator, he is their owner. Okay, remember that illustration about the paddle? Whoever creates the paddle owns the paddle, right? Whoever creates the canoe owns the canoe. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. The Lord owns the earth and all it contains, the world and all who live in it. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people. Just as the angels belonged to God because he created them, so man belonged to God because the Lord was their creator. So just as the angels had a position and responsibility, God gave a responsibility to man to take care of the garden. Then the Lord took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. Just because God didn't consult with Adam and Eve without placing them in the garden didn't mean they didn't have a choice. God had created man with a will and the ability to choose. However, when it comes to some areas of life, such as love, having the capacity to choose is meaningless if there's not alternatives. As I like to say to my kids sometimes, I'm just messing around, would you like grape juice, grape juice, or grape juice? There's not really much of a choice in there. There's no alternatives, is there? There's more important things in life. So God placed man before a simple option between two trees in the garden. In the middle of the garden, there was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The first tree mentioned is a tree of life. If man ate of this tree... He would live forever. No problem. The second tree, however, came with a warning. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve knew good, but if they would eat from that tree, they would now begin to know evil, which is a whole different matter. They had both been created as perfect beings. They were innocent of all wrong. 
their experience was limited only to God's goodness. The Bible says that if Adam and Eve ate the fruit, ate the fruit of this one tree, then not only would they know what good was, but also what evil is. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Earlier on, we saw what happens when you defy God's laws. I showed you that sign by the waterfall. It's very clear there's consequences to breaking physical laws. Well, the reality is it's not just physical laws. Also, God's spiritual laws, also, they have consequences as well if you break them. That's the principle. A broken law has consequences and applies to God's laws or commands, any of them. In this case, God gave man one simple rule. Don't eat the fruit from that one tree. The consequence of breaking that command was made just as plain. Man would die. And we'll discuss death in, in greater detail later. But it's a pretty simple, pretty clear choice. The single tree was what distinguished man as a human being and not a robot. He now had alternatives and he had a choice. To eat or not to eat. To obey or not to obey. Given that choice, Adam and Eve were removed from that realm of, of robots and androids only doing what they're programmed. It's a big difference between a person who's programmed to say, I will obey, to someone who's choosing to obey out of their own free will. Having the ability to choose is what gives the word obey meaning and depth. I say that again. Having the ability to choose and what is what gives the word obey meaning and depth. Choice makes a relationship genuine. This one restriction on the first human beings was, was scarcely a hardship. I mean, you got to ignore those paintings where it has these two people and, and they're naked and they're like only between two trees and the trees barely have any fruit on them. And there's nothing else around them. It wasn't like that. It was a garden God had created and they could eat from any of the trees. Filled with fruit, plenty of options. God had given them an abundance. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In giving Adam and Eve a choice, God was not intending for them to run off and establish their own agenda. Rather, man was created to reflect God's grandeur, to honor God through obedience. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power since you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. When a son is obedient to his dad, he honors his dad. So it is between man and God. God gave man a free will, and when man chooses to obey God, it honors God. Indeed, as creator of the universe, God deserves all the honor man could give him. Showing such respect, it only results in tremendous benefits. The Bible is really clear on this. When man fits into God's plan, he finds the greatest happiness and fulfillment and reality. So it was with Adam and Eve. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every creature that moves on the ground. God was committed to the well-being of Adam and Eve. He was there to, to fill every need that they had. And then God said, I now give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the entire earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and all the animals of the earth and to every bird of the air, and to all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. It was so. The Bible speaks of God's coming and walking with Adam and Eve. It says he came in the, the cool of the evening, and he would just come to walk with them. And Adam and Eve were able to walk with God. 
Why? Because they were innocent of any sort of evil or any wrong. They had a perfection that allowed them to walk with God, to be in his presence, to be in his company. And this is a very important point to, 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 to really bring home. Only perfect people can live in the presence of a perfect God. Only perfect people can live in the presence of a perfect God. And what an experience that must have been. This new couple, and, and the Lord shows up, and they're just talking about everything they're seeing and how they're naming the plants, and he's pointing out things that they missed. He's probably showing them how it all works together precisely. What a great relationship. A great time. No one could have been better informed on how to take care of the garden than when God showed them what to do. The world was a perfect place to live in. You see, God, he's not some distant, crusty professor who's, who's disinterested. He's the creator. He was Adam and Eve's best friend. In life, the, the ideal family relationship is you have parents who lovingly care for their children, and the children honor their parents through obedience. And that's what you have here. You have God who's made a whole universe, world, earth garden for Adam and Eve, showing his love for them, taking care of them, and they show him honor by obeying him. That is the way God created things to be. It was a friendship. God was their best friend. God saw, that all, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. There was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Creation was complete. People often start projects, and they run out of steam. They run out of motivation. They run out of time. God always finishes what he starts. He always finishes what he starts. The Lord's decisions stand forever. His plans abide throughout the ages. When creation was done, the Bible tells us that God rested on the seventh day. He scheduled a day of rest. I like that idea. Not because he was tired. God doesn't get tired. But because his creation was done. It was time to sit back and enjoy. Okay, well, thank you for your, your patience. Uh, we got a little bit late start, so I'm going to try to blow through some questions quickly. We'll take them as a group, as a review, so we can move them pretty quickly, hopefully quickly, and uh, we won't keep you much later. Okay, Genesis. The first book of the Bible means beginnings. True or false? True. True. Okay, good. According to Genesis, God created everything we see and don't see. He created... By the use of his hands, simply by speaking out of nothing, using pre-existing materials. B and C, very good. The Bible states that God knows and understands everything, but is limited in what he can do. False. 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 His power is infinite. The Bible maintains that, God, that only God possesses the, this triad of attributes. He is all... Yep, he, he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, everywhere present at, Caitlin's back there counting slashes, counting lines, one time, right? All-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present at one time. The Bible teaches the concept of pantheism, that, every, that God is in everything and everything is God. No, that's right, it's false. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible says that it took God nine days to create the world. False? How many days did it take God to create the world? Oh, somebody said seven. Six or seven? I think we'll go with six. Get a day of rest in there. He exemplified it for sure. The scriptures indicate that the world, as originally created, was different from what we now know. It's true. 
It's much different. It's much different. The whole universe functions according to precise rules, revealing that God is a God of order. That's right. Very good. Almost instinctively, we treat these natural laws with great respect because we understand that whenever you have a law, you also have a consequence. True. Do not go in the water and go over the falls. If you go over the falls, you will die. If you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. Surely die. The Bible says that God saw that it was good. In other words, everything he made was perfect, flawless, pure. Which one? You got all of the above? I don't have a D here. It's right. It's all of them. Use the word bank below to answer the following questions. God's creation was perfect because perfection is part of his character. Two other words that describe this aspect of the Lord's pure nature are righteous, the longer word, right? And holy. Both meaning without blemish. If you ever want to know what those big Bible words are, that's it. It means pure without blemish. God created the rich variety we see and experience for our enjoyment. God is a God who truly cares and loves. He did not have to create it the way he did. That's because he cares and he loves. That's right. The Bible says that man was created in the image of God. This means that we are exact duplicates of the Lord with all of his attributes. False. False. Which following statement is true? God breathed life into man. Man came to life on his own. An angel gave life to man. Hey, that's right. God breathed life to man. Because God was Adam and Eve's creator, he was also their number one fan, owner. He knew what was best for them. Owner? Or owner, probably. Owner. Yeah, I think you're right. God commanded Adam, commanded Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of life, eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, eat from any tree in the garden. Yeah, it's only B. They could have ate of the tree of life and lived forever. It's only, the, only that one tree. It gives relationship and choice meaning. You have alternatives. It's true. The ability to choose, walk, is what distinguishes man from a robot. It makes a relationship genuine. It is what gives meaning and depth to the word laughter, obedience. Choose and obedience. Very good. I think I gave that one away just now. The Bible says that mankind was created to reflect God's grandeur, to honor him as a son honors his father. True. Okay, good. Though creator of the universe, God was blank to Adam and Eve. Friend, what else? I heard some good ideas. I can't quite hear it clearly, though. Friend, what else? Owner? Right? Close and caring friend. A knowledgeable yet distant instructor. An aloof and a different stranger. A close and caring friend. Good. The scripture teaches us that only perfect people can live in the presence of a perfect God. Is that one painful to say? It is kind of painful, isn't it? But it's true. It makes sense when you think about it. It's true. Okay, well, we won't cover the extra consideration. We had a late start, and if you could take the late start out, we were actually ended on pretty much on time. Anybody have any questions, though? Five minutes over time. I appreciate your patience. Okay, well, God created everything perfect. Then what we're going to see next week, what happened? Okay? And so, obviously, it's not the way it started, but things changed. Thanks for coming. See you next week, y'all. Bye-bye, Zoom.